Good morning and welcome to Plain Speaking, a, a program that is designed to give you the democratic perspective on life, which is to make sure that you are fully protected and your life is enhanced as best we can do it under the most stringent of conditions today in our legislative branches, both at the county, the state, and the federal level. I am very happy to have your attention this morning, and I hope that the topics that we bring up will be of interest to you and encourage you to do a little more research into what it is we're talking about because, and we'll get into this a little later, we need you to participate. I'm Frank Rosenhoover, your moderator. To my immediate right is a fellow member of the Pennsylvania State Democratic Committee uh, and a friend of mine from Ebensburg, Charlie Vizzini. Morning, Charlie, welcome. Thank you. And to my left, of course, is our resident historian, researcher, treasurer, former treasurer of the party, and also a dear friend, George Thompson. So welcome again, George, to you. Morning, Frank. Morning, Frank. Now, our topics today, of course, are going to be kind of broad-based, and uh, as you will, hopefully you all watched uh, the President of the United States give his State of the Union address on Tuesday night, and I'm sure that you have certainly paid some interest in the election of a Democratic governor by the name of Tom Wolf, who was inaugurated on Tuesday also, and we have several other issues to get into, but those will be the two big ones at this point, and as the program proceeds, we will certainly be introducing other topics. And so, George, I know uh, you obviously did watch the uh, State of the Union. Today, no, I, right? I certainly did, Frank, and I've watched the several commentaries after the State of the Union address. Uh, is that where we're Yeah, started? we're going to start there because I think it had some far-reaching uh, impact. And I think uh, uh, the president, I think, for the first time in, in quite a while, felt really relaxed. And he, he even threw a few zingers out. And, uh, you know, I think he, uh, he addressed some of the uh, some of these so-called, uh, I don't know, non-blatant, uh, attempts to belittle him, but I thought he did a good job. So you want to start off by well, giving well, your fir best first best impression. Well, the first impression is uh, he's working with strength this time around because our economy has finally. I think the consensus of everyone, even Republicans, is that uh, the economy is starting to really take off. So uh, he certainly was able to deliver an address based on strength that his policies. Uh, over the last six years are working. And uh, one of the things he did is since they are now working, uh, they're working for not everyone. The, and the issue of disparity of income was a, a major theme in his uh, presentation. And in order to uh, help people uh, attain their own prosperity, and we're talking about basically the middle class, but also... Uh, the less uh, uh, fortunate people in our society, he wanted to, for example, make available community colleges for free for two years, assuming that you maintain certain standards of grade point average. Uh, you know, he also wanted to uh, shift uh, some of the tax burden, uh, and this would be neutral. Uh, the Republican commentaries after a speech kept saying, well, it's just more taxes. Well, that's, that's not really true. It's more taxes for the very high-income people in our society, but it's actually uh, been shared with uh, the people that are working that aren't uh, really successful as far as attaining a uh, good standard of living. And the way he's done this is he's proposed different tax credits for, uh, uh, for example, if you have a two-wage earner family. Uh, right now you're... Uh, able to get simply an earned income tax credit, but he wants to give two, if you're a two wage earner family, both uh, spouses or both parties in, in, in the uh, family would get an, an earned income tax credit. Uh, and an acknowledgement that it's expensive. You know, if you have your spouse out there working uh, in addition to your work, there's usually extra costs involved at a minimum travel to get to your job, but there's also child care expenses. Mm -hmm. And I know from my own 
daughter, this can uh, get very expensive, the uh, child care expenses. But uh, he's proposed policies like that to help lower income people, and it's uh, neutral. In other words, it's not really increasing the debt, which right. is everyone's which is the main worry. issue, really. You know, he's, he's getting the income from higher income, uh, the taxes from higher income people, and redistributing it to people in the lower uh, economic yeah. stratus, uh, which around here is a, a large chunk that's of the right. population. And that's why it's hard to believe how anybody who's making less than thirty or forty thousand dollars a year could right. possibly be a Republican when every initiative that they are preparing and proposing is meant to diminish them. I, I agree, George. I, I, I watched it and it is geared to the middle class, the working poor, but the one point that I took from it when he made the comment, if you could live on $15,000 a year, go out and try and do it. And when you watch the reaction of the Republicans sitting in the audience, not one of them clapped, not even Speaker Boehner. So that tells you. They know. This, well, this they, well, they were squirming, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because, because they know. You know unfortunately, <laughs> the programs that he proposed probably are not going to go anywhere. Like they've said, they're dead in the water. There may be a, a couple of them that that the Republicans may work with them on as it gets closer to the 2016 election, because I believe some of their candidates are leaning towards the middle class, making comments, we're going to help the middle class. But, you know, from a Democratic standpoint, we've seen that in the past. The, the thing about it is that one of the very first bills that the Republican Congress took up after they were sworn in on January 6th was to reduce the income under Social Security disability. So those people who are getting disability reimbursement from the Social Security Administration, these people in the Republican Party passed a bill that would diminish their monthly allowance. Well, well what they've failed to do is uh, what they've done in previous years, the uh, disability part of Social Security is running out of money. There's two separate yeah, funds. that's right. Yeah. And uh, they uh, routinely in the past have transferred money uh, from the regular Social Security program the to the disability portion of it. And now they're saying, no, we're, we refuse to do this unless... And, and here's where they're always weak. They're refusing to do it, but I'm not sure I've heard what their actual alternative is. Uh, they don't uh, have any, George. If they don't do anything, like you say, Frank, the uh, payments to the disability portion of Social Security uh, would be reduced by about 20 percent, I guess. I mean, that's all the income that they would uh, have. Uh, yeah. Well, you have them now with all the terrorist attacks. They want to defund Homeland Security. No. So you have to. You don't know where their priorities are. I know they're not working for. They're well, not for the working it, it, class, the middle class. I think it's all an indication that their agenda is not what's good for America, but what it is they can do to belittle and, and attack the president and his programming. I mean, for the, the whole oh, issue years. is not what's best for the country. Like the president said, we should be working and having better politics. We're not having that. One thing, and it was on the news this morning, uh, there was a very strong bill that was being presented by the Republican-controlled General Assembly, House of Representatives, which would have severely restricted a woman's right to make a choice about whether or not to have an abortion. And it was to be presented today, but it was withdrawn because 12 of the women in the House, who are Republicans, raised a big issue with the leadership. So there are some people in the Congress who are not going to be so overwhelmed that they're going to let reason per not prevail because they realize that if at the moment there's a heartbeat, immediately that stops any, any chance of abortion. These women know that, that it is too restrictive. And I don't know if you guys saw it on the morning news today, but the leadership of the Republican House yeah, I just withdrew saw that bill. Yeah. So, George, like you were saying, there are probably some people in the Republican side, or maybe Charlie said it, but who at least have some sense of reason 
No, I'm sure there are some. Uh, <laughs> but, but there are a few. Yeah, well, and there's this constant uh, uh, attempt by the Republicans to like pretend that Barack Obama is an unsuccessful president who has re presided over these disastrous policies. For example, <laughs> it's amazing, even though the economy has well, has actually, yeah. by most people's account, has uh, done great yeah. under yeah. President Obama. Somehow it's been a disaster if you listen to the commentary. You know, the same failed economic policies he's proposing. Well, the government takeover of different things. Well, well these are things I've heard for so many years. And are any of them true? I'd like to find out from the commentators, actually, what specific... Uh, they should challenge these statements. You know, what specifically are you referring to with the economic policies? Well, uh, see, that's uh, the talk point. about a disaster. George W. Bush's policies, which I believe were Republican in my mind, has created the, a lot of the problems. But these comments, George, that's what they did in, the, in this most current election. They sell the five-second sound bites, and the American people put the Republicans in, in control of the Congress. And I don't understand it, but... Well, I, I, I've said this for a long time, to much to the chagrin of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, but I swear that there is a department of lies and half-truths <laughs> that that party has, because if you hear one person make a comment about, let's say, the Social Security thing, every other member of that party from the national level to the state level to the county level to the city level has the same comment. You're right, Frank. You ever exactly. hear that? I mean, you, you sure. Yeah. You, and so th they, it's an orchestrated yeah. attempt yeah. to confuse, and is done by lies. And it, you know, when they say, and we'll get into this a little bit later, but when uh, when these people run on a platform like our two county commissioners, Thomas Eddy and Melling, they ran, we will not raise taxes. Well, the very first tax the thing they did when they became commissioners was to raise a tax on getting a death certificate. Remember that several mm -hmm. years ago? Now they're doing the $5 per vehicle tax increase. Now, isn't that a tax increase? They call it fees, Frank. But it's a tax I, increase. It, you, and so the whole thing is, it's part of the lies and half-truths. Why not be honest and say, we can't run government in years to come on the amount of money we made in years past? Nobody can do that. Families can't do that. Well, well, the other thing in Blair County, and I probably in Cambridge yeah. County, is the pensions. You know, they, they didn't contribute into the pension system for Blair County employees for 10 years. Well, and admitted uh, it publicly. Well, they had to because there's not enough yeah. money. And, uh, you know, is this really balanced budgeting in the government if you, if you just ignore things and, and don't fund them? Uh, and, and this, unfortunately, get back to Social Security, is one of the issues with Social Security that actually the Democrats and the Republicans really don't know what to do about. Because if th something isn't done, the uh, uh, Social Security fund is also going to be running out of money. And no one wants to talk about it because they know that it's a non-winner politically. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, and, but... Someone's going to end up having to talk about it. I will take an exception to the one thing you said. They don't know what to do. They do know what to do. Raise the cap. It says 116000 now. So you pay Social Security tax on the first 116000 you make. They had a picture of a guy in, in the paper yesterday, the New York Times. He made, in one day, by f w dealing with how the price of oil and, and the gas would, would change... He made a billion dollars. One billion dollars in one day. Now, you mean to tell me that that's not income he earned by using his mind and his whatever he uses? Why should he only pay Social Security on the first, the first 116000 George, they know what they have to do. They don't have the courage to do it. Right. And, and That's I, what I, it I agree. Is. Yeah, yeah, I well, agree. there's a, a, you know several different ways you could handle it. Actually, Barack Obama two years ago proposed the chain CPI, right. wh which which was a, a way to lower the inflation factor, mm -hmm. giving people less money. And it was interesting because the Republicans had brought this out originally. President Obama threw it out as a possible negotiating uh, chip. 
and the Republicans no, didn't no. do anything. I, you know, so so they're rather cowardly when it well, comes to social they're security. They're good to blame. They're, they, yeah, <laughs> well, they, see, they're good to blame. Again, that's nothing more than another example of regardless of how good or intelligent or beneficial the president's suggestion is, they have been ordered to say no. Now, is that the way politics is supposed to run? The CPI, Consumer Price right. Index, that was, a, that was a bold move on his part. But yet, because he made it, it's not going to fly. And that's no, the whole thing. No. Well, and I don't think, really, yeah. I don't think it should fly. Because no. really, people on Social Security don't get a lot of money. No, they don't. Uh, and no, and some don't. people, that's, in fact, that's all they for have to live a majority on. of people, that's all they, they live on when on. they retire. Yes. If you don't have uh, another pension supplementing that Social Security, you definitely are not living a high standard no, living. No, and more and more... You know, Americans are losing their pensions. The corporations are going bankrupt. They're taking their pensions away from them. And yeah, and the average American now has to live on Social Security. And well, you take the pension. You know, th there is a National Pension Guarantee Board that if a company goes bankrupt and it has a pension fund, this agency will take over the management of that pension fund. However, in the process, they have rules and regulations that set a maximum pension you can receive. And uh, one example that I've used repeatedly is that back about 10 or 12 years ago when U.S. Air yeah. first uh, yeah, went into bankruptcy, it was taken over by, and some of these retired pilots who were making good money when they retired were getting pensions up to and approaching $100,000 a year. The Pension Guarantee Board has a maximum, 56000 that's all you could get paid. Yeah. Consider yourself you were one of the pilots. Well, and of course, recently with the city of Detroit, uh, uh, they've taken a hit. I think they get 40 cents on the dollar on their pension promises that Detroit made. But Detroit's uh, out of money. People, uh, industry has left the city. It's one of the dilemmas you get into with a declining industry or a declining government. Uh, probably the city of Altoona is the same situation when it was bigger, it had more it employees, prosper. and see if they don't fund that adequately. See, that's then, the then, then when the uh, that's population starts decreasing and these uh, workers decrease, those remaining workers still have to pay for the pensions of uh, the people when the workforce was larger. See, there was a national organ uh, group called ERISA, which is an employee retirement. Department of the government, and it controls or at least sends out rules and regulations that tell every pension fund in the country that you've got to have in reserve uh, uh, the amount of money that it would take to cover the retirement of every single employee you have right now, regardless of age, which means you should have, if your pension fund would require ten billion dollars over twenty or thirty years to pay that, then you should have that much in reserve. Unfortunately, governments, local, state, and national, have just said, well, well, we'll fund it later. And the, the most egregious example, if you remember recently, the National Congress passed a ten billion dollar road bill. Yes. And one of the provisions in that bill, it said to companies, corporations, Instead of you putting money into your retirement systems, we're suggesting that you put that into the road bill and you can pay that pension later on. So here was our Congress, Bill Schuster voted for it, telling corporations, don't put it into your pension fund, but instead put it into the road fund. Now, what does that mean to those corporations' employees down the road? Because when these companies get used to not putting money in, I think it's egregious. Yeah, they, they, well, like most of these corporations, right? They, they're they're run by millionaires, billionaires. They don't look at you and I having having to live on a fixed income, or the average American living on a fixed income. Uh, getting, you know, we could get into the Affordable Care Act. Most of them don't worry about health care. They can get the best doctors in the world, the best cancer treatment in the world, but 
I or my family. Uh, I have a son who's just recently graduated from college, and fortunately, he's able to stay on my health plan till he's 26 due to the Affordable Care Act, which I, I think uh, I know there's a lot of controversy with it, but I, I think that is one aspect that that helps a lot of recent college students who you know, are still out there finding their way, looking for employment, but they at least can have stay under parents' health insurance until they're 26. But uh, most of your corporations don't don't care about the average worker anymore. You know, most of them, you know, if, if they can pay you seven dollars an hour, no benefits, per diem, part time, and again, you know, they don't want to pay the 30 hours a week that's yeah. required. Now Congress is trying to push that up to 40 hours a week, and and most of your corporations aren't going to go with that. They're going to keep everybody down at the bottom. 15, and, 20, and, and, and 25 and hours a week. They're hiring <coughs> con contract people. Well, instead right. Of, that's instead of hiring that, yeah. a person full time, and yeah. I know school districts are doing that now, hospitals and, no and department stores. We generally take two breaks during our program, and uh, usually 20 minutes after and 20 minutes before. When I get the signal from our operatives that we're going to do that, we will make sure we do it at a propitious time here. So well, well, I wanted to comment on, yeah. on your comment, Charlie, about Obamacare, yes. which, by the way, is the other thing that the Republicans love to paint as a disaster. Now, my question is, is this actually a disaster? The things that I'm reading talk about the rates that people pay. In most parts of the country, rates have actually gone mm -hmm. down. It's also described by the Republicans as the takeover of the American health care system. <laughs> now, I'd like to have a conversation with one of these Republicans to understand what Obamacare what did and how it's taking over our health care system. It's utilizing all the doctors that have always been utilized. It's uh, utilizing the uh, hospitals that, that have always been here. Uh, the only thing that I'm aware of that Obamacare did is it first of all has subsidized everyone so they can afford health care and it's also uh, you know made uh, the standards of insurance higher and there were so many policies out there that had such high deductibles that it was practically meaningless yeah. uh, to say you had insurance but unfortunately until people got sick they didn't realize that this was a problem the thing, you do the right thing, and I say this to people all the time, whenever you hear these outlandish claims, say to that person, show me, show me the facts and figures and whom you're getting them from. Most of them can't do it. They listen to the lies of lies and half-truths department, and they just spout that negativity and those lies, and they can't back it up because there isn't a way to back it up. Well, as we ponder that idea, we're going to take our first break. And when we come back, we'll keep up the conversation. In a small town of Elmira, New York, a boy was born into an all-American family. The odds of him achieving his dream in the fashion industry? One in 23 million. The odds of having a child diagnosed with autism? One in 68. I am Tommy Hilfiger, and my family is affected by autism. Learn more at autismspeaks.org slash signs. My new mom and I have a lot in common. <sighs> the great outside. We both love the outdoors. So shiny. That's not a flower. We both love geology. Oh, look. An igneous one. That's not a rock. And she knows a lot about wildlife. <gasps> a labradoodle. <laughs> That's not a dog. Hanging out has been kind of fun. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. Okay, welcome back. We have tried to give you a little bit of a thumbnail sketch of 
the President's State of the Union Address, and I think if anyone takes the time and the effort to take a look at the things the President said, they were absolutely true. This country is better, health care is better, the fact that Wall Street is not quite as greedy as they have been, however, if the current Republican-controlled Senate and House have their way, they're going to continue to vote to eliminate Obamacare, the American uh, Affordable Care Act, and they're going to continue to let Wall Street just totally run the country. We've got to be more vigilant. Now let's take turn to Pennsylvania. Uh, the current governor, Tom Wolf, did something that hadn't been done since Milton Schaap was governor, and that was to interrupt a two-year term cycle. So what do we think about this? How, what do we know about Tom Wolf uh, that we can share with our viewers? Because, you know, he was here in Altoona once or twice, and uh, I'm sure he didn't get a chance to talk to a lot of people, although there were 400 out of the AFSCME building one night. Well, well, Tom Wolf is stepping into a rather awkward situation. Uh, Talk about the Republicans and their fiscal responsibility. Your responsibility. They have <laughs> controlled both the Senate and the House and the governorship, and Tom Wolf now is walking into a $2.33 billion Def shortfall deficit. deficit. Uh, and, and where did this come from? Well, last, well, this current fiscal year, and for the state, it, it, the fiscal year starts in July 1st. So for the uh, fiscal year for the state, the current one we're in is July 1st, 2014 through June 30th, 2015. In other words, Tom Wolf will sort of take the tail end of Corbett's Governor budget. Corbett's budget that has fallen short, really, of uh, money, perhaps. Uh, he may have broken it even in this current fiscal year, but he only did it because of different transfers yeah, that the Republicans made in, in funding this uh, fiscal year. For example, uh, they uh, transferred about $322 million from one-time funds. They also, uh, I don't know if people are aware, if you have uh, checks that are uh, uncashed, a business has to turn this uncashed check into the state and there's a five-year period the businesses would have or checking accounts uh, that you know uh, people set up and then they forget about I guess and, 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 the, and the banks required to turn that over uh, to the state after five years well Corbett in order to balance this year's budget he made that a three-year period so the state all of a sudden picked up a bunch of money that normally would have uh, uh, taken two additional years for it to get. Uh, another thing they did is uh, they agreed to delay payments to nursing homes for one month. In, in other words, in this budget, I guess for June Medicaid. of 2015, Medicaid the, payments. The, the Medicaid payments, they're just not going to make the June payment. Well, how, they, how, they, how, how the, how the place is going to survive? Well, that's, that's the, the place's that's, problem, I, I guess. <laughs> these, these small, these small ones. I don't know how they're going to afford to stay open. Frank, they'll, they don't get that money from the state because a lot of them rely on Medicaid because most of the patients there can't afford self. Well, are they going to pay it back then eventually somehow? Well, of course or? they have to, yeah. and and of it's, course that'll be Governor Wolf's problem. I guess. Find the money in a budget somewhere. Well, although I should say I don't want to act like it's even Corbett's problem. Really, the way the law is set up. The governor administers the budgets that the legislature yeah, passes. Yeah. So actually, the senators and the legislators, they handed Governor Corbett this budget the same way they're going to have to hand Wolf. Governor Wolf a, a budget. And I'm just saying that it's already, if they, the, the normal budget that just is taking what you spent in the current year and you sort of transfer it to the following year, if they do that, it's going to be $2.33 billion short because of all of these one-time fixes for the current budget that they put in that, that aren't going to be available for next year. Like you say, you can't keep deferring nursing home payments. The nursing homes will all go out of business. I'm just afraid that Governor Wolf is going to run into the same scenario that President Obama. You have a very, very conservative legislature now, especially in the state Senate. It's probably more conservative now than it was prior to the election. Uh, 
one gentleman funded a lot of these candidates. He was very, very conservative, and he wanted. And you have a, a cons very, very conservative speaker at the House, probably more so than what the former speaker was, Sam, Sam Smith. Smith yeah. And hopefully, you know, Governor Wolf and his team are good negotiators. But uh, he's got a lot. You know, his first priority is funding education. Uh, we know most school districts. I'm sure this school district and many other ones have had to lay off teachers. We have 20,000 teachers that are unemployed in this state, and I know he wants to, you know, try to fund education, bring the class size down to where it is now. A lot of these schools have 30, 40 kids in a class. He wants, you know, K through 12. I don't know how he's going to be able to to work with this legislature. And you got a pen. The pension fund, which we've mentioned yeah. before, is the big uh, elephant in the room. Uh, where are they going to find money? How are they going to fund that? You know, the pension for for uh, current employees and future employees. That's another one. And then, of course, you've got the Marcellus gas tax that he wanted to propose. And, and he never mentioned that, though, by no. the way. No, he didn't, Frank. Yes, on Tuesday. And that was a glaring. Uh, omission that people are saying we want to why I certainly hope he that he's back not that. going to mitigate his position on the fracking surcharge because I, you know, with this why this well this is how he's supposed to fund education. Yeah. So getting back to education, is the Republicans in the legislature going to tax these natural gas wells, which they've adamantly defended and they they fought on? And of course, Corbett agreed. When he became governor, he wasn't going to tax them. No, so now why. that's why you know, we have such a shortfall in education funding and other areas. So hopefully Governor Wolf, as Frank said, won't renege on his promise to, to tax these gas wells and, and, uh, and increase funding for education. Well, the Independent Fiscal Office in Pennsylvania has looked at this issue of taxation of the Marcellus Shale gas and of course the argument is we don't want to drive Marcella Shell industry out of Pennsylvania. That's that's the argument. Well, uh, in the analysis the Independent Fiscal Office had, right now Pennsylvania is the lowest tax it taxes Marcella Shale gas lower than any other state. Uh, according to the Independent Fiscal Office, which is a agency in Pennsylvania government. Yeah. I mean, in other words, it's an executive agency. Yeah, Actually, Governor Corbett it was in charge of it. So I don't know if you could say it was slanted. Uh, to yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, they, they say that Pennsylvania's tax on uh, uh, gas is approximately 1.6 percent of, uh, of the production and and I, I assume they mean the price of the gas because this gets another thing it gets complicated because prices of gas go up and down and the, the currently the prices are down so it depends how you have your uh, tax set up now in the case of the Pennsylvania tax I think the tax for wells is uh, five hundred thousand dollars it's a flat fee, fee. fee. So it doesn't really vary with how much gas is being pumped out. Which can be changed, though, by legislation. Oh, oh all, of, all of this yeah. can be changed, yeah. And, and it's, uh, but other states don't have it set up that way. Other states uh, tax the uh, volume of gas that's Production. being pumped out. They also adjust by uh, the price of the gas, mm -hmm. which currently is down, but of way course down. it was up. They also, other states, uh, take into account the pipelines. Uh, to just drill the well isn't satisfactory. You've got to get it to market. Oh. So it depends whether the well is near existing gas pipelines so you can transport the gas. And so other states and their uh, fee mm. structure take all of this into account, where Pennsylvania took a simplified way and just set a certain amount each time you drill. It's, it's, a, it's a fee that doesn't vary. Right. Well, in any case, when you factor all of these complicated things in, the Independent Fiscal Office concludes that Pennsylvania is the lowest tax yeah. of, of any state on gas. So I suspect that the, they're going to remain here. <laughs> you know, the, yeah. the, 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 oh, if they, no where are they yeah. going to go? Yeah, if they yeah. go to other states, they have to pay more. But yeah. one thing about it, once you get them started, <clears throat> it would be foolish on their part to withdraw, even though you do increase the taxes, because what are they going to do? That's an investment's all gone now. Somebody's going to come in eventually and take it over. Yeah. 
Well, so the whole thing is, I think maybe Wolf was wise in not mentioning some of these specific things. It hears him how I'm going to do it, waiting to see how he's going to get the reaction from the other side, both in the Senate and the, uh, and the uh, General Assembly. So oh, right, he can't yeah. do it. It has right. to be the legislature and that does that's this. That's exactly right. And I think that's going to be something that perhaps, uh, even in the in the uh, written uh, commentary on his uh, state of the state address, it's he was short on specifics, and maybe he did that deliberately so that somebody can't say, "Uh huh, you didn't do this, you didn't do that." Well, they tried to pin him down on the income tax too, yeah, the yeah, personal yeah, income tax. Change that, and uh, you know he basically hedged. <laughs> during the campaign by saying, hey, listen, I don't know how bad I'm going, to walk, I'm going to walk into a bad situation, but I don't know how bad it's going to be. So what I propose to the legislature, because in the end, it's the legislature that has to do this. I mean, Governor Wolf can lay out his ideas yeah. of what he thinks should be done, but they have to actually do it. Yeah, when he gives his budget address, and I believe mm -hmm. I read it, I, I I believe it's more going to be March the third, and I think there'll be more specifics in there. How he's going to, you know, if he is going to tax the gas well industry, and how he's going to fund education, the pension plan. Then after his budget address, and you get the reaction of the Republican leaders in the legislature, then we'll see how long the honeymoon lasts between Governor Wolf and the uh, Republican-controlled legislature. Yeah, and I think, you know, as you, as you look at the written report, all right, I mean, the governor-elect did say that uh, nothing is more essential than working together to make sure that every child in Pennsylvania has access to the greatest education and that all teachers have the resources they need to deliver great education. Mm -hmm. So I think he's going to stick to that idea that he'll do whatever he can and should without saying, I'm going to do this specific thing, which would immediately set up a roadblock so the, 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 so the other side is complaining now while he wasn't specific while he's a little wiser than they are because you can't pin somebody down or something like that how can you argue that you want to have the best education system you can't attack a guy for saying that but once he begins to say how am I going to implement it that's, that's when the wolves gather around the carcass be the controversial well, well part right and, and in the background here we're talking about the pension system yep. eating up an increasing amount of money but we're also talking about the disparity of funding each of the individual school districts. Right. There was a report uh, issued, uh, and the Pennsylvania Association of School Ministers uh, took the report and looked at it in regard to Pennsylvania, and the gap between the funding for the rich Pennsylvania school districts and the poor Pennsylvania school districts has doubled in the last four years, according to this report. And what has happened here in Pennsylvania is the state has sort of uh, changed the funding formula oh, yeah. the, that they have. I mean, for a while, they were sort of contributing 50%. That's what well, they never hit 50%. That's, that's the way the, the, law, law. the law was written, 50%. Yeah. But, right, but yeah. they've never, ever done 50%. And, and uh, it's decreased now. The percentage uh, of funding has decreased from the state. And this has especially impacted poor school That's districts right. because the richer school districts, they would get less funding from the state, but they had the wherewithal to increase their own taxes to make up right. the difference where the poorer school districts couldn't do that. So we've had this pr problem here where you have a, a decreasing ability of the poor school districts to provide an adequate education, and in addition, they have students that are more difficult to educate to begin with because of the lower socioeconomic status in these school districts. So they're hit with a double whammy. It's yeah. more difficult to get the students taught no and they have fewer no resources to, to well, do it. I, I, right, think, Frank. I think the thing that we have to look at too is that just like with the, uh, with the president saying that we want to tax the more wealthy people to help provide the services to the less fortunate. The same thing ought to be done with education. You know, there is a provision in the law that, that, that funds education, that even the richest school district in Pennsylvania still gets a minimum of 1% of their budget from the state, regardless if they need it or not. Now, that's foolish, but what with it, because every school district budget is based upon the number of tax-paying people for property, how many businesses and industries are there, and so on. So in a little place like Claysburg or Williamsburg, 
they don't have the same level of resources in Montgomery County and so on. So I think the basic law has to be changed. Well, and, and they're working on it, I think. I, I think there's a study. Well, let's put it this way. They've set up a study commission to try to come up with a yeah. formula. Because right now there is a formula. It's sort of like whimsical. Uh, Reading. Who has the most clout. Yeah, yeah exactly. Is, Political yeah. clout. Well, actually, Phillipsburg Osceola, I think, got a, a, a bunch of money because of that reason. Uh, yeah. Sam Smith was the... <laughs> yeah, Speaker of the House Speaker and push money through for Okay, them. we're going to take our second break. When we come back, we have a couple other topics that we want to hit on. Uh, we just got, hopefully, we're whetting your appetite to <laughs> raise cane with your representatives in, in Harrisburg to get more money and to get our fair share. Okay, let's take a break. How about her? She was my baby girl, my precious baby girl. When Jamie was a teenager, she would spend her lunch hours going to the tanning salons. I didn't realize how dangerous they were. If you tan when you're young, your risk for melanoma are increased by 75%. That's huge. What I would say to mothers that allow their daughters to tan, no mother should have to visit their daughter in a cemetery. One person an hour dies from melanoma. Jamie's hour was at 1 o'clock in the afternoon on Friday, March 16, 2007. I hope no one else has to mark their hour. This message is brought to you by the American Academy of Dermatology. Savings Land here with a story for you about two young spenders named Tommy and Sue. Their parents let them buy whatever they chose, like video games and designer clothes. As they grew older, they spent all their pay on fancy cars, houses, two lattes a day. They lived in the moment, never saving a dime. When they tried to retire, they'd run out of time. Working forever is Tom and Sue's fate, so choose to save now before it's too late. Visit our website to find out more, because a happy ending's worth saving for. Okay, welcome back. Hopefully, again, we've given you some tidbits of information that will pique your interest and help you to become more informed and more active. And before we get into the issues involving the city of Altoona and their change in city government, I would like to very mention very briefly that I had, I, my wife and I attended a very good luncheon on Monday at Penn State Altoona. Uh, to celebrate the birthday of Martin Luther King, who many of you know was one of the most influential people involved in bringing to the attention of the American people and the world the great divergence between the treatment of peoples of color and other issues. And that gentleman, Martin Luther King, has done more to enhance equal treatment of people in, in, in most any other person in the country. And at this dinner and luncheon on Monday, I was quite distressed to see for the second year in a row, not one single elected official from the state or the county or the city or from any uh, borough in the, in the county came to that dinner to at least pay attention to the tremendous influence Martin Luther King has had. And I think it is, to me, it's, it's quite embarrassing when the elected officials uh, who go to many, many, many luncheons and dinners and, and public affect, uh, affairs, no one was there for the second year in a row. And I think it is just something that is very embarrassing, and I would certainly hope that in future dinners and luncheons honoring a person of Martin Luther King's stature, that there would be at least one or two elected official who would think that maybe I should go to that and show that I care about this whole issue too. So speaking of caring for issues, we'll talk about the city of Altoona, as you do know. Uh, they're in the midst right now of changing the former government in some respects uh, from what we had before. You know what? For the, since 1987, we've had a mayor who's more or less been a figurehead, who's had no authority whatsoever to select and direct and manage personnel. And the, the commission that was formed by FIAT, uh, by a vote of the, of the f citizens of Altoona, they want to have what they call a strong mayor. 
Uh, but yet they're going to maintain the strong city manager, who's going to be the manager of the whole city. So the city mayor is no, not going to have any more authority, to my knowledge, than he did before that, other than uh, they're going to pay him $75,000 a year to be a lobbyist to try to go to Harrisburg and Washington to get monies, and George had a good comment about Well, well the, the thing is, I mean, the change is they're going to pay him $75,000. Currently, the mayor doesn't get paid much of anything. Four hundred bucks. Four hundred bucks a month. Is that what he gets and paid? And has an office in his basement in his home. Well, right. Uh, <laughs> so, so the idea was to give the mayor more status, make it full-time, and, uh, you know, his job, according to the an Altoona Mirror article, was to uh, begin uh, uh, going to, uh, to represent the city at government levels, federal level, state level, I assume, to try to get grant money. I, I'm not sure if it was a PR initiative. Well, you go to lunch, the head mayor, to the governor and say thanks, and how are you doing? And uh, and like you say, Frank, I mean, in addition to the mayor at $75,000, they are still going to have a city manager who's actually responsible for everything as far as supervising all the people that work for the city. Uh, the mayor is not supposed to interfere, and actually that's the way it was under, under the old system. Yeah. Uh, he wasn't supposed to interfere with the city manager's decisions. Well, it, it continues. The, the difference, though, now is that the city manager, well, they haven't set his salary. They've gone out with... Uh, it's been in the 90s up till now. Uh, is that what they're yeah. talking about? Um, I don't know. I haven't heard a word about how they're going to set his salary. Yeah, I, so so apparently it should be more It'll than 75000 be because be more the mayor's now. not responsible for supervising anyone. Uh, he can't hire, fire, select, or Exactly. Just it's the city it. manager's job yeah, to, to, to do it. all of this. So to me, that's where the work is. Uh, now, the, there may be work with a full-time mayor if he keeps going to but Washington, D.C. what does mean if you have no control over any function of government? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, to me, the whole concept is strange. And, and uh, the other thing I wanted to comment on is the full-time mayor of $75,000 Altoon is going to pay. He's doing what I thought our... State Representative John McGinnis should be doing, which is trying to get money. Uh, John McGinnis, uh, basically his district is the city. There's a little bit of Allegheny Township that he represents. Well, how about but, our state senator too? Well, well, John Eichelberger represents all of us, and I don't know what his role is in trying to secure funding for the city of Altoona. I know John McGinnis's position is that's not his job. <laughs> In fact, he, as a sort of a Tea Party Republican, he disagrees that the uh, city should be going we'll around money scrounging money, money from the city. And he proudly says that. Yeah. He's even, to, when he taught back at Penn State Altoona, he even told his, cl his classmates, whom we had work on the Obama campaign during the last election, so I got, a talk, I got a chance to talk to some of his actual students. His position was that, if, that we shouldn't even be paying firemen, that if your house is on fire, it's your responsibility to put it out, or if there's a big pothole in front of your house, and you happen to live on 36 or, or, or 220 or whatever, you have the, it's your obligation to go fix that pothole. He, well, he has said repeatedly, very proudly, I ain't bringing nothing back. Well, this is what I, I'm getting back on my, my prior comment with Governor Wolf and the Republican-controlled legislature. Most of the philosophy down there is like your representative here in in this current district of the city of Altoona. They don't believe that the state government should fund education, should fund the state. How many state police troopers are we down now? They haven't funded, a sta you know, a, the complement of state police is down I don't know how many, and you got more and more of them retiring. This is, for the past four years, that has been their belief. We don't need state troopers. We don't need police protection. We don't need school funding. We don't need PennDOT, PennDOT plowing our highways in the, uh, in the wintertime. We'll just subcontract all that work out. And that's their philosophy. They would sooner... Why, why do that came up with Woodbury? They, we had a, a murder in Woodbury. Who's, yeah. They never have a murder. And 
the mayor of Woodbury said, well, we don't have any police department, and if you call the state police, which is yeah. supposed to serve them, you know, they may come in an hour or something. <laughs> you know, true. So, so, yeah. so uh, they have that problem. But, you know, Charlie, I'm not sympathetic with the state uh, underfunding and state police because here in Altoona, we're, we're not really a rich uh, government entity, municipality, but we have our own police department. Police department. Yeah, we do. don't need the state police because we have our, our own, although admittedly the state yeah. police do come on yeah. drug uh, uh, joint operations. Yeah. But here we have in, in our in uh, in uh, Blair County, Frankstown Township, which is our richest uh, government entity in Blair County, and they decide they don't want a, st a police department. So there they are using the state police for their crime, not paying anything more th than the city of Altoona because we contribute to the state police, although we don't really get service from them. We also pay for our own police department. Yeah. Yeah, well, up in Cambria County, which is more rural than than here, a lot of the uh, boroughs and the townships up Here's there the can't place. afford state yeah. police. I mean, excuse me, can't afford their own police departments because of the cost factor in setting up. We just had in Somerset County in uh, the Wimber area, they disbanded their yeah, police, police department. department. Now they have brought back some of their uh, police officers, but they it, they've expanded the territory that they must cover. Uh, but I, I, you know, like again, up in the uh, Evansburg area, we have a barracks up there, and and I know that I'm sure they're they're undermanned, and uh, you know sometimes you takes take, like Frank said, it takes an hour for a trooper to go one part of the county to another part of the county, and uh, well, the thing about this new form of government, it, it was intended, as I understand, primarily to get out from under the third class city code, which apparently put some barriers in, in as how to raise funds to manage government and now this whole movement into this modified strong mayor strong city manager type of government is supposed to get us out from under this old form of government and it, it, we're under this new law act 47 which gives which gave the people of the county of the city of Altoona the right to choose a new form of government and I understand Johnstown did that. Johnstown are they out of? Are they now no, in the new? Johnstown, Frank, has been in it. And I'm not familiar with the intergovernmental workings of Johnstown, but I, you know, from living in Cambria County, they've been under Act 47 for as long as I can remember. With roughly how many years? <sighs> At least 10 years, maybe longer. Uh, it, it probably goes way back with the demise of the steel industry. And then the economy sort of declined. The tax base isn't there. Uh, well, so there's no limit as, that, as to how long you can or should be under 47. Is I, there? I think there's a recent law uh, last year that was passed that does limit now. now. Yeah, now. now, now, now. Yeah. Uh, but well, those but, currently but under it can still stay there. Yeah. But yeah, I agree. They, I think the legislature or some commission reformulated that they, these cities. I believe the city of Pittsburgh is is under act. Oh yeah, yeah. Under, well, Which, Scranton is another one that's really in trouble. Yeah. I, I mean, they're they're so underfunded in their pensions in Scranton that I that I think they get about uh, uh, four. They have uh, money for forty percent of their pensions. Well, I don't know if they've ever specifically said. Here are the things we're going to do to get us out from under 47, other than this new form of government, uh, as far as getting monies together. How it's going to at least release them from this so-called cap on homeowners paying taxes on their homes, right? Well, well, Frank, the the cap really is imposed because Blair County refused to reassess. Yeah, I, I mean that was the problem all along because the re assessments were so low in Blair County that Blair County, the city of Altoona, using these 1958 assessments of properties, they ended up, uh, you know, having to to reach the cap on on what the uh, amount they could tax. Now that the values, I guess, will go up uh, or down or whatever, the the reassessment's going to increase the market value of all of the. Uh, Blair County properties. Of course, the market value had nothing to do with the last 1958 assessment, but now that it's going to officially be recognized at higher prices of real estate, now they don't need to go to the cap.
So, so really, Blair County, by uh, saying they're going to reassess, has sort of obviated the need for Act 47 in Altoona. Uh, well, then why didn't we just reassess instead of getting under Act 47? Well, because 47? no one wanted to reassess. They, they couldn't get elected. The, yeah. the only one the con was Donna Gordy, the Democratic commissioner, who constantly said we, should, we need to reassess in Blair County. And I think really what happened to cause them to reassess is Blair County itself didn't have enough money right. in the end because they were uh, caught in the same dilemma. You know, so finally they said, hey, we can't fund Blair County government unless we have the ability, you know, to increase the assessment. And that may very well have an impact on the county commissioner race coming up next year because the two current Republican uh, members of the commission ran on a position that they would not support reassessment. And Ted Bean was the only guy, the Democrat, who said he would... You know, he would oppose it, and now the two majority county commissioners have voted along with Ted now, unfortunately, to, you know, and, and the reality is it should have been done years ago. But so I'm sure that the impact on the re-election of, well, Diane Melly is not going to run, we understand, and of course Thomas Eddy's going to run, and I know Ted Beam is. There's a whole host of people out there, I think, that are looking to to take Melling's place and uh, depose Thomas Eddy, I don't know. Do you guys have any? Uh, you have any? I, I don't have any no. inside information. I've heard the different people. P.O. was one who said that he's thinking about running for. But he's he's, he's dropping. He's dropping out. Uh, he's the current con yeah. uh, treasurer. Yeah. Uh, controller. Con yeah. And of course, our county, uh, our city of Altoona controller now has announced he's going to run for P.O.'s job. Right, AC Stickle. Stickle. Yeah, so I, I'm just wondering, in the totality of this whole thing of the city getting out of from under Act, out, out the city, service class city code and all that, if reassessment itself was the answer, why would we have gone through the 47 uh, provision mm -hmm. of of applying and having to come up with all these ideas about we're going to cut police, we're going to cut firemen, we're going to cut this and cut that. I don't understand. Well, well, I don't know. It, I think when they first decided that, it wasn't clear Blair but County was going to reassess. And, of course, one of the biggies we haven't talked about is selling the water system. Or not selling it, but having a 50-year lease of yeah, the which water is system, stupid and which has sort of gone underground at this point. I mean, it came <laughs> up at the last city council meeting that I was looking at. Uh, and uh, they're still negotiating. In fact, they appointed... For the let's see, they have Mayor Martin and Bill Scherf, who are both on the uh, Altoona Water, Water Authority, Authority Board, negotiating now with the city because the the, the <laughs> Altoona Water Authority wants to eliminate any competition for the 50-year lease. I guess is the way to say it. I, I don't think the city saying they don't want to lease it. No, but I yeah, think the best one, the best proposal I would think would be acceptable would be uh, the, the ABCD Corp has come up with a plan that they would be the less the less sore or the less e so that the city would have ever more meaningful input in that so it wouldn't be a for profit organization ABCD is not for profit I see the magic numbers being flipped out to us here and we are obviously within the last minute uh, there were several other things we could have and should have done but unfortunately time constraints forbid it but we do appreciate your attention and hopefully you will begin to become more involved in what it takes to run a successful city county state and country and with 36 percent of the people voting in the last election do you understand that that means less than 18% of the people chose the leaders? 18% of the, uh, and that's all of the registered people. What about all those who don't register? We're looking at elected officials being elected by as low as 10% of the people. Is that representative government? I don't think so. But anyway, we'll have time to discuss that next time. Thank you for watching Plain Speaking. And we definitely are coming back because there's too, too much that's wrong that we want to help fix. Vote Democrat because the Democratic Party is your lifeline. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Thank, Thank you.